Hey everybody, it's Andrea Ankrum with Indivisible Northern Kentucky District 4 and welcome to another episode of our Coffee Clutch Conversations with Candidates. This is where we bring your candidate to you and ask them the questions that are important to Kentuckians today. So our guest tonight is Rick Rand. He's, for, he's running for the House seat in District 47. Welcome. Thank you very much. So, Rick, why don't you take a couple minutes and talk to our audience and tell them about yourself and why you're running for office. Yeah. Well, I, I'm Rick Rand. I am, am the current office holder and have been in, in House District 47 since uh, 2002. Uh, it comprises uh, Trimble County, the county that I reside in and live in. Uh, Henry County, Carroll County, and Gallatin County. So it's a very rural district, but a wonderful place to live and raise a family. Uh, I've, as I said, I've represented that district from uh, 2003. Agriculture is big there, as well as industry is, uh, has a large presence, especially in, in Carroll County. So, uh, you know, I have to work on a lot of issues that not only uh, deal with rural, but then again, industrial type issues. So it makes it very interesting. Uh, I enjoy representing because I, I love public service. It's really one of the main reasons I got into politics. Uh, my family was always involved in, in, not in elective office, but in public service, and I guess I caught on to that. So uh, I enjoy that. I enjoy uh, working for the people of my district. I enjoy, uh, uh, you know, being involved in, in things that are important to the community uh, and, uh, and helping people see us grow to make sure our education system is strong, that our uh, opportunity for good paying jobs is strong. So uh, that's what I tend to focus on when I'm in Frankfurt. So I look very much forward uh, to being here today and, and to answering questions and having a conversation. Great. So we do have questions um, mm -hmm. already made up, but if you're watching this live, please, if you have a question, go ahead and send them to us and we'll get them to the candidate as well. So we're going to jump right into our questions. So our first one is about um, the public employee pensions. Mm -hmm. And since you're, you said that you uh, have been in this seat um, for a while now, I think that you're gonna have a really good viewpoint right. on what's going on. So what is your understanding of the public employee pension issue, um, including current funding issues? Well, uh, you know, and I, I chaired the Appropriations and Revenue Committee for eight years in the House. So, uh, you know, I was intimately involved in, in this. and. Uh, you know, and I like to sort of set it up to say that we've been working on this for a long time now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, I took over in 2009 right at the, in the middle of the uh, Great Recession, which yes. was really a struggle. But from that time through uh, 2000, the end of 2016, we uh, worked with teachers to reform their health insurance. We did a, uh, uh, a, 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 a new program that, that uh, they contributed more, we contributed more, the school districts contributed more, and their health insurances. Uh, uh, back on track. It's very mm -hmm. strong right now. In 2013, we also uh, rehabilitated and changed the Kentucky employers' retirement. We didn't do teachers, but mm -hmm. uh, so we made major changes there. And all of these things are working. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes time. The real thing that I think happened this past session is that really Governor Bevin, I think he just wants to, I don't think he believes in public education. <laughs> in all honesty, that that's my take on it. I just don't think he's as uh, strongly aligned with public education, uh, as I am, mm -hmm. certainly, and with most people. So, you know, I think he sees it just as a, an expense, not an investment. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he said all along that I want to take these pensions and put them into a, a defined contribution plan, mm -hmm. a 401k type plan. Where that is dangerous with teachers uh, is that they do not, or they are not eligible for Social Security. Right, right. That is a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's a it's it's a big deal, and uh, if we want to continue to attract the best people into teaching, uh, especially in rural areas like I represent, because it's difficult to get people to move there. There's probably not as many things to do, and uh, it's it's right. just a little bit different living in a mm -hmm. rural area than it is a metropolitan or urban area. Uh, we have to offer them uh, uh, these type of incentives mm -hmm. uh, because. We don't pay teachers all that well. Their salaries aren't that great, and uh, uh, and but the security is important to mm -hmm. them, and I think it's important to the future of education in Kentucky. All right. So that Sen the Senate Bill One was mm -hmm. uh, defeated, mm -hmm. but then it was tacked on to the sewage bill. That's and right. It was passed. That's right. So, but but now it seems like it's been deemed unconstitutional. So, what is your understanding of what's going to happen? Is is it just back to the drawing board in the next session? Yeah, and you know the thing that I think most people don't understand is that this pension bill that that passed the House, I voted against, uh, proudly. Mm -hmm. uh, 
really d doesn't change the dynamic of funding of the existing pension system. Mm -hmm. it, it's about in the future, you know, as these employees, if they went into a, a defined contribution plan now when they got ready to retire, so you're talking about 30, 40 years down the road before it really uh, ha has any impact on, on the budget. So, uh, you know, so, so th th I think that's one thing that's been missold by the governor, that he is, uh, is, is telling people this is going to fix the pension. Well, it's not going to change the liability at all. We're still committed uh, to pay that. And with teachers not eligible for Social Security, uh, I just think it's critical for them that we maintain their existing system. Uh, and I think it's best for our education system that we can continue to attract the very best. My district lies along the Ohio River, and we have several teachers who come from Indiana, great teachers, mm -hmm. to teach in Kentucky mm -hmm. uh, because they believe our, our uh, compensation packages are better. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the General Assembly, Assembly passed mm -hmm. a $22 billion education budget, which mm -hmm. rejected some of Governor Bevin's proposed cuts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, there were many programs that were affected, such as funding for textbooks and right. money for professional development. Additionally, school districts will only get a $19 increase per student. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, um, these current rates are, are equivalent to what we had in like 2008. Like we're not, we are not moving right. forward. What are your ideas to support funding of our public education system in Kentucky? Well, I, I think the first thing I, I would like to see us do is go back to the uh, tax expenditure report. That is uh, a document or, or a system where we give tax credits. We have a certain baseline of, uh, of taxing that we do. It brings in so much revenue. Then we give companies and organizations and industries credits from that, and it has grown really beyond the amount of revenue that we take in. And I think that's the first place we need to go is go in there and close some loopholes. Mm -hmm. uh, we really didn't do any of that, any of that in the tax increase that the uh, Republicans did uh, in this past session. Mm -hmm. uh, and th in my judgment, that's the first place you start. Mm -hmm. and, and then you do, I think, have to broaden the base uh, to some degree. You have to uh, say that uh, more things need to be taxed, maybe even at a lower rate than we are now mm -hmm. because uh, most experts will tell you the best system of taxation is low rates, broad base. Mm -hmm. And we have a fairly narrow base and fairly high rates. Now, uh, the current administration and the current leadership in the House, they want to lower the rates, but they don't really want to broaden the base. Right. And so it's not working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and their tax system, of course, you know, gave uh, corporations and people at the top a tax break mm -hmm. and pushed it down on uh, on working people. Mm -hmm. So do you think that we should be increasing uh, the contributions that we're making to school Absolutely, systems? absolutely. You know, uh, as I said, I, I chaired the budget committee during the downturn and it was very difficult. My first budget in 2010, they said, guess what, you're going to have $1 billion less than we anticipated. So we we really struggled, and then mm -hmm. it, uh, you know, was a deep recession. We didn't come out of it, but we, you know, we're out of it now. Mm -hmm. We're growing now, and we need to make uh, an additional commitment. I think, like we did in 1990 when we passed CARA, we need to make that type of commitment because, really, it has been. Uh, we, we've almost lost a decade, really, right. of increases. Right. Uh, if we'd have been seeing the normal three, four, five percent increase in funding, uh, we, all of that's been lost for almost a decade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, you know, I think we need a, a punch in the arm, an infusion of capital uh, in, in our education system because I can see it in my schools. Mm -hmm. You know, they're offering less programs. They're offering right. less opportunities for students. Mm -hmm. There are less help in the classroom for classroom teachers. Textbooks are gone. Right. I mean, it's on and on and on. It's like dying a death of a thousand cuts. Right. Uh, and uh, that, that's what's going and on now. And they're still being expected to to maintain the same standards. I exactly. That's what's frustrating. Exactly. And we're still expecting them. And now, you know, charter schools, we're going to mm -hmm. find another way to undermine what you're doing. And, uh, you know, and it's like, you know, they're they're dying a slow and painful death. And So what are your thoughts on charter schools and, and oh, implementation? I, I, yeah, I, you know, charter schools may be okay in an urban setting. Mm -hmm. the, the opportunities there in a large city may have you know, different opportunities. For, for rural districts like I represent, uh, I think they just won't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the likelihood of there being a charter school in, in any uh, county that I represent is very, very slim. 
But the problem is they're going to take money away from my districts to help fund charter schools everywhere. Right. It's like creating a new school district or two or three new school districts and say, guess what, we're going to give you the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. My fear is, is that these charter schools will pop up. They're for-profit schools. Mm -hmm. They can call them public charter schools they want, but people are making profit right. in every step of the transaction when the land's bought, when the building's built, uh, when the management company's selected. All of them are, are taking, a, taking their fair share out of that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, those things are just, uh, will, will ultimately undermine public education more. People then will become discouraged with their schools because the charter schools will take the best students, they'll cherry pick the best mm -hmm. students, leaving the public schools to deal with the most challenging students, mm -hmm. which takes more money and more time, which they'll have less of, and so it's kind of a cycle of, of uh, perpetuation mm -hmm. in the wrong direction. Yeah. Right. What about um, tax credits for private school tuition that's been brought up? Before? I've never really been supportive of that. I, I think that, you know, we are responsible for delivering a system of public education that every child has access mm -hmm. to. Uh, and that's what I favor with our tax dollars. Uh, now, I think we have a, a, a good variety, especially in urban areas here in northern Kentucky mm -hmm. where we are tonight. You know, there's a good selection of of Catholic schools, of private schools, uh, you know, rural areas we don't really have that many opportunities. Uh, and that's why I am so adamant about keeping our investment in our public schools. I've discovered uh, one thing this job affords every representative the opportunity, if they take advantage, to travel around the state, mm -hmm. to see other communities, to see what's going on. And it's been my experience when I go into a community, if they are strong, it's because their public school is strong. Mm -hmm. If they are weak, it's usually because their public school is weak. So this investment in our public schools is really an investment, direct investment in our communities. Uh, and the removal of dollars is, is only hurting. Right. Not just the schools, but our entire communities. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, what are your thoughts on medical marijuana and mm -hmm. legalization of that and uh, possibly bringing jobs, uh, businesses into the state and using revenue for some of these yeah. uh, shortfalls that we have? Oh, I'm a supporter. Mm -hmm. I, I support uh, legal, and I'm, I'm not for full legalization, but for medical marijuana. Uh, I was a co-sponsor, have been a co-sponsor of the bill the last couple of years. Uh, you know, it's one of the big issues that, that I get called on. Mm -hmm. You know, education, pensions, medical marijuana is probably in the top three to five year in and year out. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I just believe that, uh, you know, if we can produce these opioids and, and these type of medications that are legal and that people use, mm -hmm. why, why can't we find a way to distribute marijuana uh, to people uh, in, in, a, in a medical setting mm -hmm. through a prescription uh, that will help them? Um, and so I, I favor that. Uh, you know, I was, uh, uh, you know, very much in favor uh, for agricultural purposes mm -hmm. for the decriminalization of hemp mm -hmm. uh, as a product. It's going to be a big deal out in the rural area I come from mm -hmm. someday. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, is, it sounds is like that, that happening? I think that's happening on the federal level. Right. And, it's, and we've already put legislation in place here several years ago that will let us take advantage of that. But I think the thing that's really holding us back is the federal designation because uh, you have to have processors, you have to have a market. If you're a farmer and you grow 10 acres of hemp, you have to have a market to take it to to sell it. Right. And those markets now are, are not fully developed. And part of the reason they're not fully developed is because processors and people that would process hemp, hemp oils, hemp fiber, uh, uh, can't get the financing because it's illegal nationally, <laughs> and so it's a little bit of a problem. Right. And uh, and and you know they're they're uh, nervous about saying, well, I'm going into a business that right. the federal government is <laughs> deemed to be illegal. Yeah, so uh, if that's lifted, and it sounds like it will, I think you'll see some growth there too okay. as well. Yeah. Why do you think the medical marijuana bills haven't passed? Well, uh, early on, I mean, these things have been around for mm -hmm. a long time. They have really come, um, uh, you know, have really gained support. I think uh, the medical industry has been opposed. Mm -hmm. uh, they seem to be softening their opposition, as, as more states do it. Uh, the law enforcement community uh, was really opposed when we passed uh, our hemp bill mm -hmm. back in, I think, 2010, 2012. I don't remember, but it's been quite a while ago. Uh, and I think now they feel more comfortable because they have a uh, 
part of the licensing uh, piece of it. You know, when you get a license, you have to write your state police on growing hemp, and, uh, you know, and can give GPS coordinates mm -hmm. where your fields are going to be and all that sort of thing. It's very uh, detailed. Uh, and I just think that the general public now has said, you know, if somebody's suffering, if someone's in pain, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if they have cancer and they're nauseated, and this will help, why not? Right. I mean, we we uh, we prescribe and, and, and distribute opioids mm -hmm. like they're candy, and those things are <laughs> unbelievably dangerous and do terrible damage mm -hmm. to people and families. Uh, and uh, marijuana's really never shown that it's highly addictive or, uh, <coughs> pardon me, or problematic mm -hmm. in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I think that is coming around. Uh, I had a call from a constituent just on Thursday about it, and I told him, I said, this may be the session, the one coming up. Mm -hmm. Uh, this may be the one where we see a little more movement. I don't think it's ever really had a a real hearing. I know they've had hearings on it, but never really where you're in a committee, you're having a hearing, we're going to take a vote on this bill. Right, right. Uh, but I, I suspect that that may happen soon. Okay. Yeah. So talking about the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. there are multiple factors involved. Mm -hmm. Big pharma, mm -hmm. physicians over prescribing, the mm -hmm. need for alternative pain medications. What are your thoughts and ideas for combating this epidemic? Well, yeah, and I think we've tried to attack it from the uh, person who's addicted right. point of view, which which you have to. I mean, we have a lot of people who, uh, and and I think and I think Attorney General Bashir, as well as Attorney Generals around the United States, are being much more aggressive with drug companies and say, you all have responsibility right. in this too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you all are manufacturing it. You all are, are seeing to the distribution of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think there's pretty clear evidence that, you know, this has been pushed mm -hmm. on unsuspecting people. I, I can speak from personal experience in 2016, I had outpatient surgery. Mm -hmm. And when I left, the doctor gave me prescriptions for antibiotics and for mm -hmm. pain. And my wife filled them and brought home a Oxycontin 30 day supply. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I, yeah, I was like, I, you know, I was really taken back by that. I thought, well, why would they give me 30 That's days, mm -hmm. why wouldn't they give me seven days and mm -hmm. say, if you're still in pain, mm -hmm. you need to come back in. And I'm not blaming the doctor. I'm yeah. sure that was protocol protocol and standards. But, you know, I think sometimes those standards have to be questioned mm -hmm. and say, is that right thing to do? Now, mm -hmm. I, I took it for just a couple of days and so I could sleep at night mm -hmm. and then told my wife, let's put that away mm -hmm. and get rid of it, and we did. So, you know, all of those things have to be looked at because it is very expensive uh, and not as effective to work at the back end on it when you're just working with treatment. Right, right. Uh, it is, it's hard to stay ahead of the curve and stay ahead of the wave that's mm -hmm. coming in, and, uh, you know, you just are always struggling, and, and it costs a lot more. It costs so much money, and you know, when people are addicted, after they're addicted, it's so much harder to get them off and keep them off, right. and and it ties law enforcement up. Mm -hmm. it, we don't have the infrastructure with counselors and all of the infrastructure, human resource infrastructure that needs to be there to help monitor and, and help people, and it's very costly to do that. So are we trying to get money from the pharmaceutical companies to help with the, the addiction I, part of it? Yeah, you know, and we have. I mean, we have uh, gotten settlements, smaller settlements, which we funnel back into uh, addiction treatment. But, uh, you know, I think something needs to change even higher mm -hmm. up than that. I think that, because uh, I, I would imagine the profits on these things are enormous. Right. Uh, for drug manufacturers, and I believe they bear mm -hmm. some of the responsibility, just as uh, tobacco companies right. finally bore some of the yes. responsibility for uh, cigarettes mm -hmm. uh, uh, all these many years ago. But just think that that took oh, 40 years right. to, <laughs> to bring right. it to and fruition. And they have to put warnings on the the product they as do. well. And is they that do. something that could also? Oh, sure. Happen? I think so. I, I can remember. Of course, I grew up in big tobacco country, mm -hmm. Carrollton. Kentucky, which is the heart of my district, was the third largest tobacco market in the world at one time. And so that culture is very strong. Right? I grew up on a tobacco farm. Uh, my dad still farms that farm, or he uh -huh. although he doesn't raise any tobacco uh -huh. anymore and hasn't for many, many years. But uh, I can remember in, I believe it was 1964, when the first Surgeon General's warning mm -hmm. on, they said, well, this is the end of our industry. <laughs> but it took 40 it years. It did take a long time, right, right. It took almost 40 right. years or, or uh, to, for it to... Uh, get to the point where, uh, you know, people said, yeah, you know, it is harmful, it is addictive, mm -hmm. it is dangerous, mm -hmm. and it cost us 
tremendous amount of resources mm -hmm. to treat people who have smoking problems. Right, okay. Okay, so higher education costs are skyrocketing. Mm -hmm. The average college mm -hmm. student ends up tens of thousands of dollars in debt upon graduating from college. My son goes to UK. Yeah. I know. Yes, I've been, I've been there and done that. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any solutions for this crisis? How can the Kentucky government support our students in their pursuit of higher education? Well, and you know, and, and that's public education too. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, um, you know, we have, uh, I, I believe it was 1998 we had the major education reform, Paul Patton did it, I believe it was 1997 or 1998, where we had the higher education reform, and we put a bunch of money in there. You know, we did Bucks for Brains, where we attracted the people. That program's really not working anymore, not effective or unfunded. I've never heard of that. Yeah, it, it, was, it was a program where we put money in there, then especially the research university could say, uh, you know, they could go out to research uh, professors and say, if you would come, uh, we have money for you because they attract money. These right. these high level research uh, 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 professors and uh, they they attract money. They bring programs with them. We were able to attract those programs in here. And and the, our theory was if you have the brain power here, yeah, that uh, that everything else will fall. But we we have been miserable mm -hmm. uh, about funding. The recession was was obviously uh, took a great toll on it, uh, and it continues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, the universities have to compete, whether they're a private or a public in, uh, university, they have to compete with uh, especially surrounding universities. Right. And uh, so, uh, you know, they've been in a spiral of raising tuition mm -hmm. for at, at uh, pretty good levels. And, and that's just a tax on people who go to college right. is all it is. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we just have to make a commitment to invest more in our, more money back to the higher to higher education exactly institutions. And, if, and if you go to any any town murray moorhead nor uh, northern kentucky university mm -hmm. it, it is a driver of uh, of innovation right. they are drivers of uh, attracting jobs mm -hmm. of just having a culture of people saying i believe in education mm -hmm. is important mm -hmm. and you go to any community that has a university and we have eight uh, including our community college, or not including our community college system. And I'm including the community mm -hmm. college because they are very important uh, out there as well. Uh, that if you look at the regions surrounding those, uh, they're very important. I, you know, I, I didn't really like the, uh, the performance-based funding. I, I have not been a big fan of that. I think it rewards the bigger universities, U of L and UK in particular. Mm -hmm and really hurts the smaller regional universities. I think as a state, we decided it's important to have a university in Eastern Kentucky right. that students can Absolutely. get to, uh, that maybe they can commute to, that they can afford in far west Kentucky and northern mm -hmm. Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, but they have all, maybe not northern Kentucky, but the other ones have been hurt by this performance-based right. funding. The big ones have done all right. Mm -hmm. The smaller ones are starting to hurt. And I think we need to get back and say, why are these universities there? Mm -hmm. You know, are they there to be profit centers? Or are they to, there to be uh, centers of education excellence right. in a region, right. uh, especially in the far reaches of our state where they need that desperately? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Governor Bevan touts the decreasing unemployment rate as a success. He's mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. It seems like he's putting mm -hmm. out something about this, um, and the national unemployment rate is at a 17-year low, 4.1%. Mm -hmm. Um, but according to the Kentucky Center for Economic Policy, the majority of job growth in Kentucky is in low-wage jobs. Yeah. Eight of the ten most common occupations in our state um, pay less than $15 an hour. And in Kentucky, 76% of jobs are in occupations that have median annual pay below 200% of the poverty level. Um, Kentucky ranks ninth worst in the nation on yeah. that measure. So yeah. how would you address the issue of the working class people not getting ahead in this current environment, it seems, of pro-corporations. We're all about bringing these co corporations in, which we need, but the wages are not <laughs> exactly. where they should be. Well, and, and part of the problem is, is we are, we are in the business now, not me, <laughs> <laughs> of really destroying uh, the, uh, uh, the fabric of, 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 of working people when we say, you know, when we uh, pass right to work, and we repeal prevailing wage, uh, you know, it, it not only hurts people who are in a union, it hurts all workers. Right. 
You know, I've told the teachers, I said, I said, you know, because let's face it, being a school teacher is middle class American mm -hmm. as it gets. Mm -hmm. That is a middle class job. Uh, and I've told teachers uh, that I believe the work they did wasn't just for their pensions, but, uh, but they were, in effect, if I can use a, a biblical phrase, standing in the gap. Uh, for all workers mm -hmm. for, for that, that have lost their voice, right. that have absolutely lost their voice, uh, and not by their own making. I mean, this has been very systematic mm -hmm. about eroding their ability to, uh, to stand up and say, well, wait a minute, mm -hmm. wait a minute. You know, we're sacrificing our time, our bodies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our families uh, to, uh, to work, and that there should be something there for us. We should have at least some voice mm -hmm. in that, and it seems like that's being lost. Right. Now, to your question directly, uh, you're exactly right because, uh, you know, I meet still with our budget review staff, and I, I, I know uh, Jason Bailey at the Center of Economic mm -hmm. Policy is mm -hmm. just excellent in the research that he does. Uh, and they, you know, they basically give me the same thing. Our legislative research staff who who uh, works on these type of issues, when I sit down and meet with them, and I still do regularly, as I did when I was budget chair, and say, if our unemployment rate is so low, and we are creating jobs at this level, why is our revenue into the state lagging behind? Mm -hmm. And their answer, they said, well, the simple answer is, is that the jobs we're losing, uh, and, and you do, I mean, in an economy, there's always churn, mm -hmm. you know, jobs are leaving and mm -hmm. jobs are coming in but that the new jobs are being created are, are just a lower paying job. Oh, right. uh, and that uh, inflation eats into, mm -hmm. pe even people have good paying job, inflation's eating into right. their, their, uh, uh, their wages mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's creating this uh, a lag mm -hmm. in revenue growth in our state mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, and I think moving away from a, uh, from, uh, to a consumption based tax will only make that worse. Right because as soon as people have a little problem in their life, first thing they do is bang, I'm not gonna buy anything. Mm -hmm. And they stop consuming. Mm -hmm. It happened in 2008, our, our, our sales tax, it was just in a matter of two or three months, just bottomed out mm -hmm. because people said, whoa, mm -hmm. you know, no washing machine, <laughs> right, no new car. I don't, I, I, you know, look, we're not going there. Right, right. Uh, and so, but I think you're exactly right. I think that's exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you think about raising the minimum wage then? Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm for it. Uh, you know, I, you know it, I, I go in and out of places uh, all the time in my small rural district and see people who are, uh, well, the, the, the uh, woman that sells me coffee at the local gas station is raising her three grandchildren and, mm -hmm. she, and I helped her with her kinship care. Mm -hmm. She's her grandmother, she got them, and she finally caught me one morning, said I'm gonna get my kinship care, but she was doing that on a minimum wage job. She can't do that. Right. It won't work. It mm -hmm. doesn't add up. There's no way mm -hmm. that uh, a minimum wage, uh, it's, what is $7.25? Right, I mean, right. it, it's, those are poverty wages. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, uh, you know, then those people have to look for government assistance. Mm -hmm. They need food stamps. They need Medicaid because most of those jobs don't uh, provide any sort of health care. Mm -hmm. And it is, uh, you know, we need to find a way uh, to get that up. I was, you know, I voted for the last increase, mm -hmm. but that's been several years ago now, probably 10 years ago. There was a Senate Bill 17 that was looking, um, <clears throat> but may never mm -hmm. made it out of the Senate, mm -hmm. I don't know, um, up to $10 an hour oh, by sure. 2020. Never made it yeah. Okay. yeah, that bill's been around, and we passed that bill out of the House mm -hmm. where you would, oh, over a three year uh, cycle, bump it up because it is awfully hard for a small business. Right to all of a sudden go from seven to 10, they don't right. have time to adjust. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and they don't always have control over their prices. They're selling products that are pre-priced mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, like a business like mine, I'm in the insurance business and you know, my company says, here's your rates, right. go to it. <laughs> right. And uh, you know, I, I don't have an opportunity to mark them up or anything like that, so I have to be careful. But uh, you know, we, we have to look at that. I think we have to get back and say, what is a living wage mm -hmm. in the United States mm -hmm. of America? and uh, you know, sort of wear the shoes of somebody who wear it makes $7.25. Right, right. So do you think that maybe going after some of the bigger corporations like Walmart, let's just say, who have people <laughs> sure. on welfare mm -hmm. and that, that the state is paying for because they're not making a living wage, sure. try to recoup some of that somehow. Yeah. I know yeah. that's been brought up on the federal level. Yeah, but. yeah, yeah. I, th I think they're, they're probably one of the biggest violators mm -hmm. uh, for that matter of, in terms of 
sort of managing their their employees that way. I'm sure they're very sophisticated, and if I pay somebody exactly this amount, then they are still eligible for some government assistance, mm -hmm. and that will get them through. And it, uh, you know, we need to, yeah, look at that because uh, God bless Walmart. When they come into a small town, it, it's it's not only are there wages relatively low, it really hurts other small businesses that have been there uh, for a long time. It, it really does. Okay, so um, some of the unemployment numbers in Kentucky uh, are due to the lack of skilled workers mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. displaced workers, older workers mm -hmm. who um, haven't rejoined the right. job market. How do we ensure that we have enough skilled workers um, to support our growing economy? Well, uh, you, you have to start in high school, I think. I think you have to uh, we have to do a better job, and I think we're moving in that direction, mm -hmm. and moving in that direction in a in a in a, uh, uh, a strong way by letting students know when they're eighth grade freshmen that you know it's okay if you don't want to go to mm -hmm. a four year university. That's okay. Mm -hmm. You know there are good jobs out there, so you know I think schools are doing that. I'll tell you a few couple of things that we have done in my district. One thing is that. Uh, uh, we built a new community college right. campus mm -hmm. up there mm -hmm. uh, that really focuses uh, on that. And uh, and the local industries can go to the community college and develop programs specifically to them to mm -hmm. say, if you can get students in and teach them this, we can hire them right away at a, at a maybe $15, $16 an hour and max mm -hmm. out at maybe $25, $30 mm -hmm. an hour, which is a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've done that, and that is working very, very well in, in my district and around the state. The other thing that we did, we have five school districts, Trimble County, Carroll County, Henry County, Gallatin County, Owen County, that have gone together and developed an I-Lead Academy, mm -hmm. which in effect is a charter school, that, but they totally control the school. The five school districts do, mm -hmm. and they send 10 students from each school each year, <clears throat> and it is a heavily STEM-based education. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they, uh, the first two years, you go to the I Lead Academy, uh, that's in a strip mall in Carrollton, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and you're there. And then the last two years, you're actually at the Jefferson Community College Carrollton campus mm -hmm. to finish your degree, and wow. then you graduate from your high school mm -hmm. with an associate degree. Wow! Uh, and so it's incredible mm -hmm. uh, the energy that that has created. Uh, and I believe it'll be a great model around the state to say, you know, this is a direction yeah, we can go right. because the students choose to go. They have to be chosen mm -hmm. that, yeah, you're, you're capable of doing this work, but then they choose, yes, I mm -hmm. want to do that. Uh, because it's a big commitment. They're bused to another school. They're right. not with their friends, mm -hmm. uh, but they're with a smaller group. But the students that have been in it, and not all of them have been successful. Some have dropped out and mm -hmm. gone back to regular school. Mm -hmm. But the students in, that are in it, I mean, when I see them and their parents, they are just... Uh, overjoyed mm -hmm. about the opportunity that their child has to uh, really focus on that. So how do we spread that to other yeah. districts around Kentucky and, and including vocational schools? Mm -hmm. Our My son's high school has a great vocational it does, school, yeah. but other areas, yeah. you know, other schools around here don't have that. So how do we get that, get that well, opportunities for everybody? Uh, you know, not every school can afford a vocational mm -hmm. school. I mean, they're very expensive. And I, I think we what we tried to do is build out community colleges because with the campus there in Carrollton, uh, the need for a vocational school at Trimble County or Henry County is not as great. Mm -hmm. It doesn't put as much pressure on them to have to have the school. How do I fund the school uh, that they can partner? And I think that's the key. You have to get school districts willing to partner. That's the hard part, mm -hmm. to get five school districts, <laughs> five superintendents, five school boards to commit <laughs> to, to one uh, theory and one location mm -hmm. uh, because there are a lot of logistics, getting kids over there. How do I get them over there? You know, how do I decide which kids get an right, opportunity right. to do that? But that's the way. Now, here in northern Kentucky, I mean, you all, uh, even though you have uh, separate counties and mm -hmm. communities, I mean, it's you, you all have a real oneness up here. Yes, yes. That, uh, that you could. But that we, we were successful at that. And, and But I have uh, other districts around the state looking at it. But mm -hmm. I think that's the real success is how do you sort of regionalize right. it mm -hmm. and drive the cost down and, mm -hmm. and, and so you can... Uh, so you can do it and you know have committed teachers who want to do it. Right, mm -hmm. okay. So we talked a little bit about this um, right to work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clearly mm -hmm. anti-union mm -hmm. and we did pass mm -hmm. um, a right to work uh, process here in <clears throat> Kentucky. What are your thoughts on that now that we are a right to work environment and, and um, what do you propose to do about that? Well, I, I hope we can repeal it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, that, that would be my goal. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I don't know why 
uh, why it's important. I mean, we don't do any. I mean, a, a labor union is a, a, a private a, a private organization, <laughs> uh, just like the board of realtors I belong to, or or anything mm-hmm. else. I don't know why it's important that we just focus on them. Uh, maybe because they're politically active, mm-hmm. or maybe it's because uh, these big companies want to drive labor costs down. Mm-hmm. Uh, they want to get by with driving labor costs mm-hmm. down, and it's uh, you know it's really disappointing and. Uh, to to think, and as I said before, you know the unions have stood in the gap for a long time because uh, for all workers, you know every worker enjoys some degree of of uh, um, the benefits that benefits the, the unions have you know. that the bene- that the unions have provided. You know safety in the workplace, uh, 40 days hours off, a week. forty <laughs> hours a week, time off. Overtime. Uh, be- health insurance uh-huh. benefits. Uh, you name it. Uh, you know that. Uh, you know you. You know you. You have rights as a worker, and and now we're eroding that. And uh, and you know. And I, I. I just don't understand why we. Well, I. I, I know exactly why we attack mm-hmm. them, mm-hmm. or not we, but they attack them. But it's uh, beyond me. Uh, you know, I don't like paying my realtor dues. But I have to do it to get in the multiple listings, and I'd love to get in the multiple listings and not have to pay my dues. Right. But right. but nobody's standing up for that. Right. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, we we uh, uh, and labor's out there fighting hard. They're fighting yeah. hard. They they really are. Yep. And God bless them. I'm with them 100. <laughs> percent Great. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we had a new tax system put in mm-hmm. place, mm-hmm. Uh, which is a huge tax cut for the mm-hmm. wealthiest Kentuckians. Uh, and a shift uh, in mm-hmm. reliance onto everyone else. Um, there's a 5% ta- flat tax, which mm-hmm. lowered taxes for the wealthy mm-hmm. and raised taxes on the poor. So, and there's service-based tax and charity uh, taxes. So yeah. um, what are your thoughts on the current uh, tax system and um, what should we do dif- differently uh, well, to make it better? Yeah, and, and this was not tax reform, it was a tax shift. Mm-hmm. And they would say, well, it was it was neutral. Uh, well, if you're bringing in an extra $500 million, it's not neutral. Somebody's paying for that right. in real dollars. Those are real dollars that somebody's paying for. I think uh, most people don't understand is that we went to a flat tax, a 5% mm-hmm. flat tax. So, the, But, uh, you know, we had a, a graduated system before up to 75000 where I think the first 3000 were taxed it so much and on up. So now you're going to be taxed from dollar one on five percent. Mm-hmm. So if you were seventy five thousand dollars a blow, you're going to pay a lot more. Right. Uh, and and I think they they figure with the with the uh, increase in the sales tax on on various uh, items that about one hundred seventy five thousand is really where you get a big tax break. Got it. And the corporations, uh, and you know, and they're just you know, like I said, these consumption tax are are just another way to push taxes on working people right. because they use much more of their dollars consuming. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, if you talk to the average person on the street, they'll say, well, that's the most fair. And I'll say, no, it's not the most fair. It's the most easy to figure. Right. It's easy to kind of calculate in my head, okay, that, but it's not the most fair, right. uh, not not by a long shot. And if I discovered one thing because I chaired the budget committee through the economic downturn, is that states that had a diverse system of taxation fared much better. Mm-hmm. States that did not did not fare very well, like Nevada, which is very heavy sales tax, and they would be because of the tourism they have there, mm-hmm. with Las Vegas and some of their tourism, but they took a real beating. Mm-hmm. Uh, and even though we did take a beating, ours was more diverse, and we were able to kind of manage our way through it a little mm-hmm. bit mm-hmm. better than uh, than a lot of other states. So. so, what do you what what would you like to see happen? Well, I, I, you know, we have lowered the corporate rate from eight to five percent. That's almost forty percent since two thousand and six. Mm-hmm. Most people don't remember the two thousand and six tax thing was a, a big change to corporations. Mm-hmm. So we've lowered it from eight to six. I, you know, I just wanted to see it, to see it, fair. Mm-hmm. You know, if we are going to increase taxes, uh, then everybody needs to share in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, but there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can go back to the tax expenditure report and say, we're not going to really raise your rate, but we're not going to give you a break. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of these tax loopholes were put in place many, many years ago to help attract a certain industry, and we don't know if they're still working. We don't know if they're still holding jobs or attracting jobs, and 
we don't know mm -hmm. and we don't have the data to prove any of it and uh, you know we've got to get back to uh, to that a more knowledge base on on what is working mm -hmm. uh, and what is not mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't appear what we're doing now is working very well <laughs> and why we keep doing more of the same thing I don't Good know question. Yeah. yes <laughs> okay um, you may be familiar with this but House uh -huh. Bill 227 was a, basically an anti-solar bill it was. right? It um, was. and it passed I believe uh, um, well, it passed the House, not the Senate. Okay, so it didn't it, go it, into effect. It didn't go into effect. But it basically wanted to reward uh, monopoly utility companies mm -hmm. and punish consumers, right? right? Mm -hmm. um, Kentucky needs to keep up with the rest of the country in terms of clean, green energy. Mm -hmm. What would you do, do to help protect and promote the use of clean energy? Well, I vote against that bill to begin with. And I'm going to tell you, it, it, it was not easy for me. I served on a rural electric board for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, in, in the rural electrics, and they're different than the investor owns because they answer to the consumers. Mm -hmm. You know, they were put in place in the 30s during the, uh, during the, uh, uh, the New Deal mm -hmm. uh, because uh, investor owns wouldn't invest in rural areas and extend lines, so they let them develop cooperatives and farmers got together and got electricity, mm -hmm. you know, and so that's where a cooperative comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, you know, it was not easy for me, but I voted against it for a couple of reasons. Number one, the law always has safeguards in there. Their argument was that uh, that oh, all this new solar's coming, it's going to take uh, consumers away from from uh, regular utility mm -hmm. customers, and uh, uh, and uh, rates are going to have to go up. But there's stop gaps in there to prevent that from happening. Now, I think the real motivation behind it was that uh, that utility companies want that action. Mm -hmm. They want to be the they want to be the only player right. in the game, and they don't want all these little private companies out mm -hmm. there. Uh, now, being from a rural area, I think that the best thing to do is let these private companies do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Let them expand solar. Let them invest in solar. You know, I can envision on my dad's farm, and you know, in a barn that's, you know, a thousand yards away from anywhere. That at some point, if he wants lights back there, he get a solar panel, right? Very cheaply. Yep. And put back there, and when he needs lights, he'll have lights, right. uh, because he's, you know, just back there mm -hmm. certain times of the year. Right. Uh, but now he has to pay a minimum bill. Mm -hmm. He has to run a line back there. He has to maintain all of that. And I think it would be a good thing. I know a, a lot of farmers are that are putting up these big grain bins. Now the grain is important. Uh, are going solar with them, mm -hmm. you know, because it's very expensive to to uh, run uh, lines out there and pay the electric costs because you only need to dry that grain at certain times of year. The rest of the time they're just kind of sitting there right. uh, idle, yeah. Okay. Okay, so this is a, mm -hmm. a hot topic. Um, okay. And it's about guns. Okay. Um, and this is, you know, with the school shootings that have sure. happened. We just had sure. a, a shooting here mm -hmm. in uh, Cincinnati across the river. That's right. Um, just recently. Um, what are your thoughts on um, stricter gun ownership laws? Do you think we need them? Um, do you think that everything is fine the way it is? I know you're from a rural area. A lot of people own guns. Do. What are your thoughts on, on that topic? You know, it is, it is, it's, you know, it's a tough topic, mm -hmm. awfully, obviously. I, you know, I'm a, a big, you know, I'm a big supporter of the Second Amendment. I don't mind saying that I am, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and have been in my, you know, I've, you know, when you, when you've been there 20 years, you have a, a pretty good record of, of where you stand on things. Right. You know, I, th I think that we need to, uh, and, and I think they are right. They, they see schools as not only a, uh, a target that is relatively soft. Mm -hmm. It's easy to get in, it's easy to get out. A lot of times these are former students, kids know, and you know, mm -hmm. what do kids think? They open the door for somebody right. and let them in. Uh, and as well as they're high profile for somebody that's gonna do something like that, they get right. a lot of profile. Uh, you know, we need to, you know, invest more in school safety. Uh, in my opinion, we need to, uh, you know, uh, find ways, you know, and I hate the thought of kids going to Trimble County High School having to go through a metal detector. That's just, you know, beyond me to think that we're at that place, but we are. Uh, but we can take measures, I think, to to make sure uh, doors are locked, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that students are educated. Look, the reason we ask you not to let your friends and make them come through the front door is for your safety right, right. and to teach them that these are important things mm -hmm. that, uh, that uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, you need to be forever vigilant mm -hmm. on these type of things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I would favor moving in that direction. What are your thoughts on arming teachers in public schools? No, I think was, that's a bad idea. 
because there, uh, there's been that was a topic that was brought up here yeah. locally as well. Um, well, in almost every one of these school shootings, there were resource officers mm -hmm. there, armed resource officers that we put in there for this reason. And I don't blame them. I mean, these are terrible situations, and you're dealing with uh, people who have uh, automatic weapons or, or semi-automatic weapons, at least, mm -hmm. that uh, you know they can do tremendous damage in seconds. In literal seconds, they know where to go. They know what their target is. They go to common areas where no students are going to be there. Uh, but, uh, but you know, I, I think that uh, schools are going to have to sit down and say, what is our plan and what are our resources here? But the thing about it is, you can't continue to push these costs on schools. Right. If we're going to require more resource officers, we've got to invest more money in them. Right. Right. Uh, and we haven't been willing to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um. It seems like recently Governor Bevan has declared war on Medicaid recipients. Um, you know, we had a lot of people take advantage of the mm -hmm. Medicaid expansion, mm -hmm. um, and he seems to want to cut back on that with the work re work requirements and the whole issue with the dental mm -hmm. and vision. He right. cut that. Mm -hmm. um, so what would you do to support uh, people who need to be on Medicaid and the Medicaid program? You know, uh, you know access to health care should be everyone's right. Uh, it shouldn't matter that, you know, I'm fortunate enough to be in the state health insurance mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I get the calls. I, I get calls every day uh, from people that are just, I don't know where to go. Right. I don't know what to do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I had a lady, I, I, I share this story with people. I had a lady call me one morning and she said, uh, you know, she was a waitress at Waffle House. Mm -hmm. Uh, in my district, had two little boys. She had been diagnosed with brain cancer mm -hmm. and had to have chemotherapy and didn't have any insurance and couldn't find anybody to do it. Could you imagine waking up in the morning and having to face that? I mean, she shouldn't have to. And we were able to call the University of Louisville and they got her in and did, but she shouldn't have to do that. Right. She should have a caring doctor that will guide her through that mm -hmm. and say, here's what we're gonna do and how. You know, uh, you know healthcare is, is huge not just in this state, but, but everywhere in terms of the economic activity that it creates in our communities. Right. Carroll County Memorial Hospital in Carrollton is the only hospital contained in my district. Mm -hmm. But they have expanded since the expansion right. of Medicaid. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been able to offer more programs. They've been able to do more wellness. Mm -hmm. They've been able to get people in to teach them uh, how to manage their health care. Mm -hmm. And all of these things take time. They don't happen overnight when you're dealing with populations that have never had to do that in their life. Mm -hmm. The only way they've been able to manage their health care is go to the emergency room. Right, right. Just so, the worst. <laughs> uh, you know, if there's a better way mm -hmm. than using Medicaid for this, I haven't heard it. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have not heard it because we are talking about a population that is probably, uh, the private insurance market is probably not going to take on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, you know, we, you know, until we have a better idea, uh, I'm open to all ideas, mm -hmm. but I haven't heard a better one. And just taking people, you know, Governor Bevin has threatened to end this Medicaid expansion since before he was elected. Right. And I don't, and if, and if he feels so strongly about it, I don't know why he doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe I do know why he doesn't. He knows it's probably working, mm -hmm. and he probably knows to kick 600,000 people off of their health insurance would be not only a nightmare for them, but for our communities as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like he uses it as like a bargaining chip. He does. Like, if I don't get this, then yeah. I'm going to do this. Yeah. And that's just Well, I got fun. news for him. It doesn't work with me. <laughs> yeah. Um, how would you support um, the farmers in your district and across Kentucky? And well, you talked about uh, your rural district. It's how my favorite them? thing. <laughs> I grew up on a farm. My dad has a cattle farm, and it's just it's just part of my DNA uh, <laughs> to, to uh, love farmers and you know, and not just farmers, but, uh, you know, a rural way of life. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's just uh, the greatest thing, if that's what you like. <laughs> uh, and, you know, and I have been, I think, very supportive. You know, we were very wise in 2000 when the tobacco settlement agreement happened mm -hmm. and the dollars, a uh, tremendous number of dollars flowed back to all these states. A lot of states just put that money in their budget and it was just kind of baked in the cake then. Mm -hmm. We didn't do that. We said we're going to take half of that, which amounts to about $100 million a year. We're going to take half of that and we're going to put it over in education, I mean in the, to agriculture, mm -hmm. and we are going to invest in uh, diversity, mm -hmm. getting people away from tobacco and into diverse uh, fields of agriculture. 
Uh, and, you know, you can come to my county of Trimble County and cattle are king there, not tobacco, mm -hmm. cattle. We have horticulture that's sprung up there because we're not that far from Louisville and these, uh, these uh, people, landscapers, will buy land and grow their stock there, mm -hmm. which is, a, it's agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, we have hemp. Uh, we have a lot of corn and soybeans. Tobacco's probably 10 or 12 down the line now. Mm -hmm. And so we have invested, and in, not only have we done it at state level, we've done it at the local level by go, drilling down at the local level and, and using matching grants to get farmers to buy the necessary equipment they did to, to, to be able to handle their cattle, to doctor their cattle, to, to, um, you know, to teach them about good practices on their farm. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm most proud of that I've done for agriculture is that uh, not many people know, but I served a term in the Senate from 91 to 94, and I passed uh, a, a water quality bill. And we were trying to get ahead of federal regulations that were coming down. We thought, well, if these regulations are coming, let, let's dictate the best way for Kentucky. And that evolved into the current conservation district program in Kentucky. And these conservation districts go out with farmers and teach them how to keep their streams clean how to manage their streams, if they have to cross the stream, mm -hmm. you know, cross it in one place, don't let your cattle cross it up and down the stream, how to water your cattle, how to manage your, your, uh, your hay and your mm -hmm. pasture and, and to prevent runoff and soil erosion. And it's just been incredible uh, what that's turned into. And I, it's, I'm, I'm as, as proud of that as anything I've ever done in, in the General Assembly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, last question here. Yeah. What is the one um, issue that you, uh, is your priority if you get Oh, elected? education. Education. It has been, mm -hmm. and I think it's even more important now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we were uh, at, at the uh, end of this session, uh, and, and you may know Tom Fitzgerald. He's been an environmental lawyer in Louisville, a leading environmental lawyer for many, many years. He's well known in Frankfurt because mm -hmm. he takes on all the hard fights mm -hmm. uh, on the environment. And, I, and I've worked with him, I haven't always agreed with him, but we've worked together really good. And I saw him after a session one day and he said, you must be discouraged. I said, I have never been more fired up in my life because I know exactly <laughs> what, what we're about mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good time for Democrats to, to identify and to tell people this, this is who we are mm -hmm. and this is what we stand for. And public education has to be number one. Right. I mean, it's just, uh, especially for rural areas, mm -hmm. many times it's the largest employer. Right. And almost always it's the center of your, your county and your yeah. community. It's the absolute center. What goes on there uh, controls, it helps you attract jobs, it mm -hmm. helps you attract factories. It's mm -hmm. just, uh, and so I'm going to continue to, to fight for funding and fight for teachers, and uh, that's what I'm going to do. Great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of our questions. Why don't you take a couple minutes now and talk to our audience and yeah. tell them why they should vote for you on November 6th. Well, uh, and again, thank you very much. It's, it's been a, a great pleasure to be here and talk about these important issues. I've, uh, you know, tried to work really hard uh, in my district in the 16 years I've, I've been in the House of Representatives and, and to hear your concerns and to uh, be a mirror image uh, uh, and, and to be a leader in, in the General Assembly in Kentucky for the issues that are important to me. Back home, we talked about a few here, agriculture and, and education and, and creating job opportunities for the people I represent. And I want to continue to do that. Uh, my door is always open, and I hope everybody in my district knows that, that uh, I'm, ac I'm accessible and I'm, I'm open to those communications. So I hope you'll keep that in mind, and I hope to see you soon out campaigning that, that uh, I can count on your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rick, for joining us thank tonight. You. And thank you, everybody, for joining us as well. And please don't forget to join us every Sunday night at 5 and 7 on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. And you can watch recordings of these as well. So have a good night, everybody.